Good morning, happy Wednesday. This is a little weird for me because I'm actually recording this about two hours ahead of when I normally record because I got that kind of day. Um, got a lot of calls today, got clinic time, etc., etc. So I got to kind of cut to the chase. I'm going to do a, a question from, from Rachel. I'm actually only, only, only going to do part of her question um, because it was a really long question, had a lot of, a lot of parts to it. But, but basically uh, what Rachel's asking is, I'm having a hard time con conceptualizing anterior posterior compression if an individual shows a posterior compression to anterior, so, so pushing from the back, um, they will lose external rotation uh, in the extremities. She says, in my mind, if someone's compressing posteriorly, wouldn't the muscles be concentrically right and wouldn't this lead to gains in external rotation? Okay, so this gives me an opportunity to talk about something. So what we're using is a representative model of, of movement in the things that I like to talk about. And it depends on, on what model you're using as to what your interpretation of what's happening would be. And so the more detailed the model, obviously the more options that we have. And, and with the one thing we always have to understand is that the model is not reality. And so if your model is less refined or if you're using a different model, then your interpretations will be different. And so let me grab the pubs real quick. So if we use dead guy anatomy, which is what a lot of, uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, a lot of the information is based on, uh, we, we have this perception somehow that this sucker doesn't bend, twist, move the way, the way it actually does. And then we have this, this thought process that, that this hip joint is somehow fixed in space when the reality is it moves a great deal, it reorients, it changes direction. And so if I use dead guy anatomy and I say that um, I'm doing um, a cadaver dissection, I say these muscles are external rotators because when I pull on them, the hip does this. And so Rachel, in your model, you are absolutely correct. That's, that, that's what would happen. But I don't think that's as close to reality as we can get. So I think we can have a little bit more of a refined model. So if we think about a posterior compression, so a posterior compression would, would, would be activity of the muscles that go across this upper portion of the posterior aspect of the pelvis that push forward. And what that actually does is it changes the direction of the acetabulum. So the socket actually changes its direction. And so if I change the direction, so if I compress here and I change the direction of the, of the acetabulum, what happens is, is I pick up internal rotation and I lose external rotation. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about these compressive strategies. So every compressive strategy either reorients or changes shape or has some other influence that produces an outcome. And the more understanding we have in respect of how this thing actually can move, so we have to refine our model. We can't use the dead guy anatomy as our representation like most books try to do. And then they try to resolve these things. And now we have this massively confusing model with multiple rules and, and no foundational principles. If we take the same concept up into the thorax, okay, uh, where I have the traditionally upward rotation of the scapula. That is a posterior compressive strategy in the thorax. That reorients the glenoid and it produces an internal rotation element. So through that middle range of, of overhead reach, that's why that would become an internally rotated position um, that we would use as, as we talk about moving through, through inhalation to exhalation to in, inhalation. Again, we're talking about that posterior element so I, I appreciate this, this question so much because I know there's a massive amount of confusion as, as to why these things exist. What it comes down to is evolving your model, adding detail, layers of detail. You, it doesn't matter where you start. You're not right and you're not wrong. All models have limitations and that's the one thing that we need to understand. It's just how much detail can we superimpose onto what we already know. So, so Rachel, take what you're already thinking because you're not wrong under certain circumstances, but now you need to add to this model and say, okay, if I compress this, now what happens with an understanding a little bit more about what the options actually are um, within a little bit more of a realistic model. We're never gonna see reality. We always have to use a model because this is a really, really complex concept and when we talk about about movement 
And so hopefully that answers a little bit of your question. I, I apologize I had to rush today, but I got a lot of stuff going on this morning. You guys have a great Wednesday. It is the gorgeous one's birthday today. And one of the best things ever, she forgot it was her birthday today. So I love that. And, and that's one of the reasons why I married her. So you guys have a great Wednesday and I'll see you. Oh, coaches and coffee uh, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. I'll see you guys then.